Shalom Chavim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. This segment today is a prophetic insight, uh, a message that I feel very, uh, very serious about and sharing with my Jewish brothers and sisters living over in Israel and, of course, around the world. Those of our brothers and sisters that have yet to recognize who the Mashiach is, who the Messiah is. I think our broadcast today may once again give you a little bit more insight looking at those things that the rabbis have missed, things that we have overlooked. I say rabbis because the rabbis as the spiritual teachers of Israel today should have recognized some of the more obvious signs of the Messiah. In this broadcast today, I'll be speaking with my rabbis or my rabbinical brethren and uh, our brothers and sisters that are Jewish around the world, regardless of what nation, what language you might speak if you're able to understand this video about very things that have clearly been missed. I want to start off this morning because I was actually looking at the prophecies about the temple of God. And of course, the temple itself, oddly enough, if you think about the temple that was made by Solomon, uh, later uh, Hezekiah uh, rebuilding the, the, the second temple uh, after Solomon's temple was built there, it is made of what? It is made from stones. It is a temple made by hands. And the Most High dwelleth not in temples made by hands. As the Prophet Isaiah writes here, says here, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you may build unto me? Where is the place that may be my resting place? For all these things hath my hand made, and so all these things came to be, say, uh, saith the Lord. But on this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. God's desire is to dwell in a human heart. And of course, he was actually speaking about the coming of the Mashiach. The entire chapter 66 really deals with this, but we have completely, as a Jewish people, as, as an Israelite population around the world, and I say, normally I say Jewish, referring to the house of Judah, because many of the house of Israel later became believers as a result of the uh, disciples and the 70 that were sent abroad, taking the message of Jesus Christ to the house of Israel. They ended up believing the message of Jesus Christ. The problem is, as we find out in prophecy, is that even though they embrace this message, they end up going into idolatry later, as we read about Ephraim. Ephraim is defiled with his idols. Let him alone. That was speaking about the modern day church today, believe it or not. And so in the days that we come to this conclusion, both Jew and Gentile alike really need an awakening. Really do need an awakening. It's a very serious situation. I wonder why, as the scripture says, if the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. Because why? The church itself has become blind. As it says in Revelation, I think about the Laodiceans. They are blind, naked, miserable, wretched, and do not even know it. So what good can the church do? I mean, I appreciate the church really loves the Lord Jesus. They believe him to be their Messiah. And I appreciate that with all of my heart. But there's got to be a sound doctrinal restoration of God's word for Israel's eyes to come open. And the only thing we're doing here is softening up the ground hallowing the ground, making ready for those seeds that they can actually receive the true word of God, that water of the word. Now, what caught my attention in Isaiah chapter 66, though, is as you go down, we get down here to verse 12. I'm going to back up just a little bit here, and let's look at some more of this. Let's look, say, maybe from verse 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Who? Well, back, back up a little before. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things as a land born in one day? 
is a nation brought forth at once. For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Now, now we have it in the plural, all right? But the point is, it also represents the coming of Christ. And the coming of Christ is the birth of the nation, the birth of Israel. Shall I bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God? That's a twofold, twofold revelation here. It also replies, applies to what would happen in the latter days here. But looking at this, watch what happens. Rejoice you with Jerusalem and be glad with her. All you that love her, rejoice for joy with her. All you that mourn for her. Again, like I said, it's a twofold revelation and there's two times of mourning for Israel. There is a mourning when Christ was crucified. Jesus Christ, Yeshua himself was crucified 2,000 years ago and his uh, followers mourned for him as a family who lost their only son, as we read in Zechariah chapter 12. But we also know that there comes a latter morning when Israel returns to her promised land, also in Zechariah 12. And we'll go into that in just a moment. moment. But look at this. He says here, Rejoice you with Jerusalem and be glad with her. All you that love her, rejoice for, uh, for joy with her. All you that mourn for her, that you may suck and be satisfied with the breast of her consolation, that you may drink deeply with delight of the abundance of her glory. Pay close attention to verse 12. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream. Actually, the wealth of the Gentiles like an overflowing stream. And you shall suck thereof. You shall be born upon the side and shall be dandled upon the knees. And rabbinical brethren, you are looking at a passage that clearly shows the very birth of humanity in itself. But it's a redemptive birth. You remember, let's back up to Genesis chapter 2 before I move forward. And let me remind you the way that God brought forth his first bride for man. And the Lord caused, let me back up just a moment here. Verse 20, and the man gave names to all the cattle. Chapter 2, verse 20, and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And by the way, that's not a subservient job either when God says for Adam and Ezra, Kanigido, it is a helper. It is a helper, but not in the sense of subordination because for a woman it's used, I think, two times in the Tanakh. The rest of the times it's used for the eternal father of heaven as a Ezra. Is he your subordinate one? No, but he helps us. He guides us and moves us this way and moves us that way. And Kanigido in Hebrew is a helper against him. In other words, she helps to guide that marriage so that you can balance out your relationship. Do you think that when God said to the man, you know, when there was a fall in the garden, which comes not long after this here, and he says, that he shall rule over her, that it was a divine gift? Or do you recognize the fact that because they both fail and both are held responsible and because his eyes were open in what he did, that it is a nature of what happens to the man and he rules over her contrary to God's law? They were partners. Okay? Don't have time to go into that different message altogether, but pay attention though here, okay? And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept and he took one of his ribs. That's debatable whether the word is rib. It just says side in Hebrew. He took his side and closed up the place with the flesh instead thereof. He removed something from the man's side, from Adam's side, and with this, the God had taken from the man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. From the side, the birth of woman. The two of them being one, she was literally inside of him. They were at one time, because God created both 
male and female created he them in Genesis chapter 1. Male and female made he them. They were just one, but one being. Now God is separating, and now we have the woman separately on the side there. So now notice the verbiage then here in Isaiah 66. You shall be born upon the side. Now, you might want to say that's being held. You could use that as well. Even like carrying the baby or dawdling the baby on the knees. But the whole point is, is that baby is coming from the side. And it's like what a river. And a well, see, what is it? I will extend peace to her like a river and a wealth of the Gentiles like an overflowing stream. All right. Now, where is that, though? If we can recognize that this could possibly be pointing to the Mashiach, to the Messiah, because it speaks that the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, then let's take a look at something even more profound. Let's look over here in John chapter, I believe, forget which chapter John is in. Let me just take a quick look here. John chapter 4, we're down here at verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the, to the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, because she's half Jew, half Gentile. Or I shouldn't say half Jew, she is half Israelite. She's from the house of Israel. And it was through the, uh, the toppling of the house of Israel through the Syrians uh, and they got pregnant by them that they become what they called Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him, and he would give thee living water. The woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, with and the well is deep, and whence then uh, hast thou that living water. All right, so what does Isaiah say over here? I will extend peace to her like a river, the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream, living waters. All right? Now, she says, Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well to drink thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever shall drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give unto him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. All right, again, Isaiah, what does it say? I will extend peace to her like a river and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream. Oh my gosh, friends. The woman saith to him, Sir, give me this water that I, neither, not, that, I, that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I, uh, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast said, I have no husband. Thou said, Well, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that did, saidest thou truly. Now that got her attention because he knew those things about her. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. But the whole point is, Jesus, Yeshua, was giving this woman a sign to look for. What was that sign? That sign was shown in John later, chapter 19, as well as prophesied by Zechariah chapter 12. We're going to get into both those. And as well foreshadowed in the very story of Exodus chapter 17 and the smiting of the rock. Let's look at it. All right. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. This is during the uh, crucifixion story, right? They put him on the cross. They had judged him. Remember what all happened before that? You know, let's just kind of build up that case a little bit because we're going to look at that in a moment. Um, well, we know this story. Let me just back up just a little bit here. All right. 
Verse 10, Then saith Pilate to him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto you hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not a Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called in the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Do you think it's any wonder today that in Israel, that the high priest of Israel right now, or the chief rabbi of Israel, is allowing the Pope of Rome to come to Israel and making friends with him. Why? Because what did the chief rabbi or the chief priest say there? We have no king but Caesar, and you still want a Roman hierarchy living in Israel. Well, let me tell you something. The only reason you want it there is because you have no idea that the scripture must be fulfilled. Jesus himself, Yeshua HaMashiach in Isaiah chapter 61. Let me bring it to your memory so that you will know for what I'm telling you to be the truth. He came when he was here on the earth and he read from Isaiah as a scroll was handed to him by the priest. He said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to bring good tidings unto the humble. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening eyes of them that are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's good pleasure. He closed the scroll. He rolled it back up. He handed it to the priest and he said, This day this scripture is fulfilled within your hearing. He did not read, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort what all that mourn. You know why? Because all had not mourned as of yet. Only a portion of Israel had mourned. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them garland for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the mantle of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the terebinths of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, wherein he might glory. Not the planting of Rome or some other church or something of that nature there, but a true indwelling of the Spirit of Almighty God that comes from the river, the, river, the water of life flowing from the belly. Let me take you now over to Zechariah 12 to make my point clear. All right. Starting in verse 10, And that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem that stumble among them, and at that day shall be uh, at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as a godlike being, as the angel of the Lord being before them. Alright? Notice he's coming to defend those that stumbled, those that failed, those that didn't recognize Yeshua to be Mashiach rabbis. It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look unto me because they have thrust him through. Whether you want to say it's the hands of the feet or the Roman soldier that put the spear in his side. But when a spear went into his side and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for the firstborn. Well, what do you know? You don't have to mince words with me over the word uh, thrust through. I know exactly what it means and, and how it can be and how it's to be translated, all right? But nonetheless, all right, let's read on over here in John's prophecy, though, so we don't get this mixed up. What happened to Yeshua then? And it was the preparation, oh, let's move on down. We were actually at, uh, what was it, around verse 34, I believe it was. After, you know, he's all condemned by Pilate and the Romans and the Jews condemned him. And, and you know why the Jews condemned him? Let me tell you why. Remember the story of Joseph and Benjamin? Benjamin was the last brother to come down. And even though he was your own brother, you could not recognize him. 
all the tribes of Israel standing there, and none of them could recognize their own brother, let alone the house of Israel from the split of the nation. And to this day, you're still split. You know why you're split? Because you're being allowed a Roman hierarchy to interfere in the politics of Israel. And so you stay split unless Rome says you can do it. And Rome wants to do the Mechodeshit. That's not bringing in the house of Israel. That's not uniting the two nations back as one. That's why God brings the house of Judah home first. All right? So as we look at this, what happens? You go on. You're, you, you, you've, in the case of Benjamin, what did Joseph do? As a prophecy, he puts his cup in Benjamin's bag who had nothing to do with selling him out or throwing him into the pit or anything else. But why did he do it? Because God knows in his own foreknowledge that Benjamites in the latter days would reject the second Joseph. And they would reject him at the communion table. When Jesus took that, that grape the fruit of the grapevine there and he poured it into the cup and he passed it amongst his disciples and said, drink this. If you don't drink it, you have no part with me. Eat of this bread, it's my body. This is of my blood. If you don't do it, you have no part with me. But yet one of them, Judas Iscariot, he betrays him. Showing a type of Benjamin. Who was it that was calling out for his blood? Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Maybe that was an atoning grace for them. Just like it was in the case of Joseph. They take his garment. What do they do? They take, they got to answer to their father now. Their brother is now gone. So they take it and they kill a lamb, pour the blood on his garment, go back and say, can you identify who this garment belongs to? And he weeps and mourns. You don't think that God couldn't recognize his own son when you allowed him to be put on a cross? I can't just say yourselves, my family was there as well. I, I bear that with you. But we don't recognize it. Instead, we cry out for his blood, just like his brothers cried out for Joseph, and they put the blood upon his garment, take it back to the father, try to hide their sins. Maybe that innocent little lamb is what covered them temporarily until the blood of the real lamb could come. We go down though to verse 34 when he's finally there in that position. He's already been nailed to the cross, etc. And it says here in verse 33, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already because he had already given up that ghost, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record and his record is true and he knoweth that he say, saith true that you might believe. From the side is a river of water of life. From the belly, as Jesus says to the woman at the well. Or another scripture, I believe it is, living waters from the belly. He says to the woman at the well, I'll give you living water that you don't come here to drink anymore. That was prophesying of what would happen here. And not only was it prophesied there, my rabbinical brethren, but let's also take, and let's go to Exodus chapter 17 as a reminder, as a prophetic sign of what would happen in our day. And all the congregations of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin by their stages according to the commandment of the Lord and encamped in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. What do you know? Why? You're caught up and around the land of the giants. Still today, allowing the Rephaim to get involved. Wherefore the people strove with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. What did the, what did the woman do at the well? You know, you want water? The well's deep. You ain't got nothing to draw with. You ain't, you're, not a, you're not a Samaritan. 
And Moses said to them, Why strive you with me? Wherefore did you try the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore hast thou brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord and saying, What shall I do unto this people? They are almost ready to stone me. They did stone Christ, basically. Put him on a cross. Who knows, maybe a stone was used to nail in the nails. I don't know, just a conjecture. The Lord said unto Moses, Pass on before the people and take with you the elders of Israel. Pass on before the people. A future day. The elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river and take in thy hand and go and behold I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb and thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel and the name of the place was called Messiah in Mirhabah because of the striving of the children of Israel and because they tried the Lord saying is the Lord among us or not same thing when Yeshua was here same thing that Zechariah prophesied when he said he would be thrust through no it's not talking about the nails in his hands or in his feet it, that is overwritten in the psalm for you you've already got that one there Zechariah was talking about the rod like Moses' rod. The only difference is they stuck a spear on the tip of the rod and this time they smote the rock which Christ Jesus was that rock. And according to the prophecy here in Moses' time over in the book of Exodus, it says that God was on that rock. And you did it because why? You were arguing whether or not God was among you or not. And when Jesus was here, they said, is he the Messiah or is he not? And the Roman hierarchy that was controlling that of, well, I, I should say, the rabbinical priests were controlling Rome at that particular point because they were saying, that, telling Pilate, if you're not a friend of Caesar's, then you're no friend of ours. Do you think it's changed today? You know, and I don't say that there's not some good things that Prime Minister Netanyahu does. He does. I realize he does. I know they did a video condemning him where he's trying to stop the peace process. But who knows? He says this to this family, but who really knows what was being said? The point is, Israel's politicians are under so much pressure from Rome. I don't know how they even exist with it. And then there's so many people that are out there willing to listen to some Mossad agent that's controlled by Rome. And you let your ears be tickled. Look at the word of God and follow what the truth is. We're trying to get Israel to recognize her Messiah, planting the seeds so that she might recognize Christ was that rock. What came from that rock when Moses smote it with his staff? Water come from that rock. What happened when Christ was smitten with another staff, only with a spear on the side? Water came from the rock, Christ Jesus. What did Isaiah say in chapter 66? For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the wealth of the Gentiles like an overflowing stream. He was prophesying of Christ, and how could you miss it? But this is our day. This is our day. Let me show you what happens in Zechariah again, though. When they mourn for him that was thrust through as one that mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as in the morning of Hadad, Rimon, in the valley of Megiddon. And the land shall mourn every family apart. The family of the house of David apart, their wives apart. The family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. The family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart. And the family of the, Sh of, of the Shemites apart, and their wives apart. There's Shemai right there. Shemai is a Benjamite. Did you know it? 
Remember the story of Joseph again, as it's just brought out? Remember the story of David? Shemai, Benjamin, Benjamin with the cup. Unbelievable. My friends, I love you. My rabbinical brothers and sisters, I love you. My Christian friends that are listening to this broadcast, if this is what you want our people to hear and to wake up to recognize that in true indeed that Yeshua was Messiah, stand with us in what we're doing here. We are ready to shake. We are ready to shake Israel with the truth of the Messiah that has been overlooked. And we will go back to the revelations before and even as this happens nearly every week it seems like God is revealing another one. You want to support this work? Then we need your help. IsraeliNewsLive.org You can donate there. You can mail us as well. Our address, I never remember it, the Noon Institute, 8297 Champions Gate Boulevard, number 442. That's box 442, Champions Gate, Florida, 33896. Also, if you're watching in Europe, your believer is over in Europe, you can write us in Europe as well at our address there. Support the work we're doing. We're getting, we thank you. We love you. We've got friends uh, even in Europe that are, that are contributing. Even as far away as China is economically depressed as they are. They're hearing the word of Jesus Christ. And that's, it's not just Israel too. We've got to wake up the children of Israel, because the, there is a spiritual Israel that is also groping in darkness all over the world. Because those that have recognized Yeshua to be the Messiah, they have received that life that come from His side, they are also Israel and part of the family. We love you guys. God bless you. Thank you for your support for this ministry and the work that we're doing here. And we look to do more as the days move forward. And we have heard your, your, your uh, comments about the broadcast. We will cease the broadcast on DirecTV because our objective is to spend the time in getting this message to the world. And as we look at the news on this broadcast and look at this, if it appears to be something that is shaping prophetically, we will share it with you to warn, to show the lateness of the hour. Share this message everywhere you possibly can because truly Christ is coming. And He is not only coming for His bride, but He's also coming that the eyes of Israel may open once again. As Paul wrote in Romans 11, especially as he said, don't think they're, they're enemies for your sake right now, but just have mercy. Just like in the story of Joseph, they can't help it, friends. Visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. We are writing on there, by the way, uh, more regularly as well. You might want to read some of the articles that are coming up on there. And we do have one transcriber working on broadcast as well. And I know others have written me. Please bear with me. I'll get back with you because we need more transcribers because I'll need this message here transcribed as well that for the Chinese friends in China as well as for the Jews around the world and other friends in other parts of the world. God bless you and thank you for watching. Shalom.